School's out, but when you're the boss of the largest public education system in the country, it's not possible to take the summer off. David Banks is here. The point starts right now. He's got a budget of over $30 billion, about a million students, and some 75,000 teachers, and is trying to change the city's education system to fit the new realities of high-tech society. New York City Schools Chancellor David Banks joins me now, and I want to start out talking about AI, high-tech, and how what the perils and the, the um, promise of artificial intelligence is for the New York City school system. First of all, I think that uh, what we've seen most recently with ChatGBT and some of the challenges that it in fact has presented is something that caused a little bit of trepidation and even gave us some pause uh, in terms of how our kids are really going to be prepared. But after taking some time to really reflect, we're really working hard to get out in front of this. We're going to seek to certainly engage our kids and our teachers in this process. This technology, Marsha, is here. And we have to recognize it, um, and we're going to we're going to do everything we can to get our kids and our teachers ready. But see, here's my question. I mean, a lot of people have raised raised issues with whether the information they get from chat and other um, artificial intelligence always have the right answers. And you know, and so how do you use it in a positive way without it having negative effects in the school system? Well, we're not all the way there yet, but what I'm saying is that we're engaged very much in the process. The, the right answers are not always going to be there. This is a new emerging technology, and I think the bigger issue for us is preparing our teachers, training our teachers, helping them to become much more familiar with the technology while also starting to prepare our kids. Kids are using the technology now anyway. It's already there. So it's, it's just a matter of us being able to manage it and get in front of it. But some people think it's like cheating, you know, like you call up AI or the chat web or whatever and you get an answer. Is that, is, is that like using in the past where you could buy these cheap books when you would go to the bookstore when you were in college? Yeah. <laughs> well, I certainly didn't do that, uh, Marcia. Uh, but, but the reality is that there are always shortcuts to cheating for people that seek to cheat. We are working to try to get systems in place that will help us to be able to circumvent those kinds of things and to put the safeguards in place. But I do think that there are so many problems that our society faces and that our kids can absolutely be engaged in in schools in terms of trying to help to solve society's problems. That this technology, when it's used the right way and we get our kids fully ready, can be of tremendous benefit. So it's not just simply about can you get all the right answers on the exam or to write your essay for you. There are so many more ways for us to use this technology. That's what we're really focused on. Are there ways that you can talk about now or are you still working out the program? We're still working out and that's part, that's part of the issue but I think you're going to hear in the coming weeks about a lot of good stuff. We're meeting with some r r real great uh, companies who are doing this work as well and talking to them about ways in which they can help us support us in this work. So this comes as you are trying to revamp how New York City students learn to read. You want to go into to a phonics-based system. I want you to tell our viewers why this makes sense and why what was used before wasn't optimal. Well, many of our viewers, your viewers, depending upon how old they are, uh, remember when they were coming up in the schools, they, they learned how to read by decoding words and using phonics. Uh, but over the last 20 to 25 years in our school system, we got away from that. And uh, we started to use a very different approach that for far too many kids has not worked. So we are, we're bringing them uh, back to the basics and we're gonna ensure that all of our kids, it's not just phonics, because phonics, you can learn how to decode a word and you can pronounce it, but that doesn't mean you know what it means. That's and true. so you have to continue to build uh, their comprehension, their fluency. Uh, there are a lot of pieces that are connected to a really robust reading program. Phonics is just the basics of it and the basic foundation. But you can't build a house starting on the second floor, Marsha. And that's what we were doing. We had far too many kids who didn't have the solid foundation in place. We're going to ensure that they get that. So do you think that this system is going to change how New York City students do on reading tests? Absolutely. That's what the big bet is. 
we've been preparing kids. Kids have been taking these standardized exams without the basic foundation in place. You can't, you, you're always going to have difficulty taking any standardized exams if you don't know how to read. Our kids were not reading on grade level. So if you're an eighth grader taking any standardized exam in the eighth grade and you're reading on a fourth grade level, how do we expect that you're going to pass that exam? It is the number one thing, Marsha, that I have realized since I've become chancellor. We have missed the basic foundation that reading as a core. When you have that down, it helps you become successful in math, science, and all the other subjects. But it's very hard to do that when you don't have that basic foundation in place. And that's what we're going to make sure they have. Well, this actually comes as um, New York City reading scores have fallen according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And I know you and I had talked about it a few weeks ago. I wonder why this has happened. Is it just the way they've learned to read? Is it the pandemic? Is it a mix of things? The NAEP scores, these national scores, have fallen all across the nation. There's very few states where they did not see a drop. So New York City has also seen a drop. But that's because this approach to t how we teach reading is a national approach. It's not just a New York City approach. So over the last 25 years, there, there was a, a something called balanced literacy. Right. And balanced literacy really, at its core, had kids guessing a lot at what a word might be. If you see a picture in a book and taking a guess at what the word might be if you put it in context. But without pictures, <laughs> kids were really hard pressed to actually read words. And uh, so after that, when you're starting to take standardized exams across the board, you're already at a deficit. But was the pandemic partially to blame remote learning, partially to blame for this, or was this something that you see was a trend that was happening nationally anyway? It was happening anyway. It just got exacerbated. Uh, uh, by the pandemic, uh, and but but also the good thing about the pandemic was a lot of parents and families got a chance to see by observing what was happening remotely, just why you know the flaws in, in how their kids were actually learning to read, and so you started to hear about a lot of activists around the nation who got much more involved, parent activists to say. You know, we've been standing now for quite some time, and we realize now, we can see it clearly ourselves, there's a flawed approach to how our kids are actually reading. So it was happening for many years before the pandemic. So I certainly don't blame the pandemic. The pandemic was able to shine a light on it. But also the scores in New York City have fallen on the state standardized tests as well. And this has sort of sent the Board of Regents on a path towards um, reducing proficiency standards. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Is it something you, you would like to see stopped? Well, I, I think that's a, a somewhat of a mixed bag, right? W what we want to make sure is that kids are able to pass any standardized exams that are put in front of them. I think what the state is also grappling with is, well, how many, how many sta uh, standardized exams do kids have to take? And do those standardized exams actually demonstrate what kids know and are able to do? And so I support the state in its effort to make some adjustments. Um, but what I'm a big proponent of is rigorous instruction, and there ought to certainly be a standard where we as a society are able to see that. And the state is still trying to find the, 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 the common ground on all of it. The reason I'm asking the question is some people have suggested this, this is a dumbing down of expectations, and that's not a good thing. Well, I think the reason some people say that um, is because whenever they see a reduction in standardized exams, they think that there's some form of a dumbing down. But I would just simply uh, say to you, there's some of the pri top private schools in New York City and around the country don't take standardized exams at all. And they're getting a high quality educational experience. We simply want to ensure that our kids are getting a great experience as well. Not saying get rid of all the tests, but make sure that whatever tests the kids are taking actually demonstrate um, what they know and they're able to do. So we're time for a break. We'll be right back. We're back with school's chancellor, David Banks. Another problem for the school system is chronic absenteeism. I read a statistic that stunned me, that nearly half of the students in New York City schools have as many as 18 days where they miss school. What are we doing about it, and why is this going on? I think a lot of that has been a result of the pandemic and still coming off the pandemic. Listen, Marshall, kids, kids went through a lot of traumatic experiences during the pandemic. 
and it manifests itself sometimes in ways in which we see some of our struggles to kind of get all of our kids back. But, uh, but those numbers have improved significantly since we started in this administration. So the numbers are dropping. Chronic absenteeism is not kids who just don't go to school at all. Um, if you miss two days a month from school, you're considered chronically absent. And so many of these kids are kids who go to school, but they're still just missing too much time from school. A lot of issues in their, in their families and other kinds of things that the kids are personally dealing with. Um, but we continue to work really hard and, and we've been seeing real improvement. The reason I'm asking the question is I was wondering if it had anything to do with your decision to change how kids can go to school. I know that um, under the last teacher contract, the newest teacher contract, right. you're going to allow remote learning where people could go to school at night. Well, if that contract gets ratified, and we're certainly hopeful that it's going to happen in, in any day now, we think it's a great contract, not only for the teachers, but also for the administration. This is one of the innovative approaches. Kids will be able to take some classes at night, on the weekends. Um, uh, yeah, some kids who don't come to school regularly because they've got to work. They've got to do some other things to support, support their own families. They're in some challenging situations. This virtual learning piece that we put in will allow them to be able to still work, do what they need to do personally, and still make sure that they're not falling behind in school. Again, it's, it's a result of new technology. Being able to use this in a very proactive way is something that we are very, very excited about. But I also think that it could cut down on absenteeism because kids would be able to pick when is the most advantageous time for them to learn. It'll cut down on absenteeism, but it will also, think about this, Marsha, we've got kids who do really well. They're high performers in school. It will help them to even accelerate. They can graduate early because they can take additional classes virtually. So if you've got a son or a daughter at home who's already performing really well and they want to continue to work hard, they can take classes on a Saturday in the evenings and get even further ahead of their classmates. Who says you have to graduate from high school in four years? You can graduate in three years if you're prepared to put in the work. That's what this new technology is going to allow us to do. So let's talk about the class size and the, the state law that says that you have to have reduction in the number of kids in a different class. But I've been looking at some statistics that show that often in um, low-income areas, which have the largest number of black and brown students, they already have smaller classes. And ironically, in some of the wealthier areas, the classes are bigger. So my question to you is, could this rule force you to pour more money into already wealthier districts at the expense of the impoverished districts that need the money more? That is one of the concerns that we have. We, we were not big proponents of the class size bill. Listen, I'm the chancellor. I, I, I want to see all schools have small class sizes, right? Um, but the reality is that the research tells us the small class sizes are not the end all be all. It's quality of the teacher that you have in the classroom. Because I can give you a small class with a mediocre teacher, or I can give you a larger class with a phenomenal teacher. And the kids with the phenomenal teacher are gonna do even better. So that's what my focus has been. But in the, in, in, you know, nonetheless, it's new legislation, uh, and we're gonna work hard to make sure that all of these class sizes uh, remain underneath the cap that we have been uh, legislated to, to do. Is it going to cost you more money to do it? It is absolutely going to cost more money. It's going to certainly cost um, um, many more millions of dollars over time. Listen, for the next couple of years, we're in good shape. We don't think we're going to have any major issues in being able to comply with the law. Um, but by the time we hit the years three, four, and five, which the law allows for us to do, uh, that's when you're going to see much greater costs. We're going to have to build out new classrooms, new schools in order to be compliant. Um, and those are going to be the kinds of costs that are going to be decisions that we have to make. The costs that we're going to have to spend to, to do that are dollars that we could have used in, uh, for other programs. You know, you, when you talk about building out new schools, I also think about the fact that now there, there's a rule, that, a law that was passed that will allow the people to build more charter schools. 14 more charter schools could be opened here in New York City, and they often go to you as the head of the New York City public school system to give them other space so they can co-locate in the city school. Sure. Is that going to make it more difficult for you to do that? And are you going to actually have to physically build more schools in order to meet this class size mandate? We're probably going to have to build more schools to certainly meet the class size mandate. Now, as it relates to the charter schools themselves, we're always working as hard as we can to find space 
where we can co-locate a charter school in an existing building that, in fact, has the space. As you know, we've lost many thousands of students over the last several years, close to that number, over the last five or six years. Um, those numbers have gotten better since we've come into this administration. I'm happy to say that. But we still have places where we do have some space, and we're going to use that as our first option. Now, those are never... You know, something that anybody jumps up and down about. Nobody wants to share space, whether it's a charter school or not. But if we don't find spaces for charter schools to co locate, then we have to pay the rent for those charters in a standalone facility. Those dollars then are dollars that we would have used for something else that we then have to use for the charter school. So, one way or another, um, you know, there's some tough choices that we have to make. We're going to do the best we can. But also adding to the, the uh, enrollment in the school system has been the children of migrants and asylum seekers who have come to New York. You have about, what, 10,000 students now? 18,000. 18,000. We're yeah. now up to 18,000. So what kind of a challenge is that for you in finding uh, teachers who can teach English as a second language and deal with people who have a language barrier? It's a challenge, but we're making some new hires on our team as well, um, of folks who are going to be charged with helping us to actually go out and recruit more, more teachers. And we're looking at teachers from outside of New York. We're looking at teachers from outside of uh, the United States that we can also look to bring here to help us to do that. Is this well. another program with the Dominican Republic or are you looking beyond that? Even beyond the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic initiative that we were working out, which had some bumps along the way, um, was an example of the kind of innovative thinking that we're, we're trying to employ here to get teachers uh, from other places that could also help to support us in this need. This is a growing need. The largest population of students in the New York City public school system are Latino students. They represent 41% of our kids. The black population in New York City is only 24% and has been dropping for years. The white percentage is only 15% and dropping. Asian is 17% and growing. So um, we've got some challenges to meet to find the, uh, the right kinds of educators, particularly in our bilingual programs, but, uh, but we're working at it. Are you able to find teachers from the countries that are sending us immigrants who can speak both languages who might be able to help out, or are you going other places? We're looking at all of it, from some of those countries, from other states states um, because the, this new teacher contract that we just signed uh, which is a great contract um, we want to use that as an enticement to get other folks who want to come and work here in New York City the whole world lives here and uh, we think this is a great city to work in to teach in and to live in so we only have about a minute left I wanted to ask you about mental health and I know you've started a new mindful breathing program but one of the questions I had Illinois just passed a bill that would allow students uh, to take up to five mental health days um, if they need them is that an idea that might be good for New York City certainly something to, to, to take a look at I'm not, I'm, I'm not as familiar with that uh, my struggle has been to make sure we get all kids to come to school every single day so uh, providing more days for them to have off has not been my priority I'm trying to get them in and I think that when you talk about mental health what we have found in schools one of the best things is, is the relationships with with their teachers and when kids come to school every day it's not just the schoolwork but it's being around their peers and it's being around teachers who really care about them makes a big, big difference. Okay, Chancellor, we're going to have to leave it right there for now. But our conversation continues right after the show on our streaming channel, CBS News New York.